We're here live in Las Vegas with theCUBE's coverage of Amazon ReMars. It's a reInvent, ReMars, reinforced the big three shows called The Re's. This is Mars, machine learning, automation, robotics in space. It's a program about the future, and the future innovation around industrial, cloud scale, climate change, the moon, a lot of great topics. Really connecting all the dots together here in Las Vegas with Amazon ReMars. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Our first guest is Howard Hugh, program manager, and that's Orion program. Howard is involved in all the action in space and the Moon Project, which we'll get into. Howard, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Well, hey, thanks for having me here this morning. Appreciate you guys uh, inviting me here. So this show is not obvious to the normal tech observer. For the insiders in, in the industry, it's the confluence of a lot of things coming together. It's going to be obvious very soon because the stuff they're showing here is pretty impressive. It's motivating, it's positive, and it's a force for change and good. All of it coming together. Space, machine learning, robotics, industrial. You have one of the coolest areas, the space. What's going on with the Orion program? You guys got the big moon project. Take a minute to explain. Well, let me tell you, I'll start with Orion. Orion is our next human spacecraft that's going to take humans beyond low Earth orbit. And we're part of the broader Artemis campaign. So Artemis is our uh, plan, our NASA's plan, to return uh, the first person of color, first woman, back to the moon. And we're very excited to do that. We have several missions uh, that I could talk to you about, uh, starting with, in a very few months, Artemis One. So Artemis One is going to fly on the Space Launch System, which is going to be the biggest uh, rocket, we call it the Mega Rocket, has been built since the Saturn V. On top of the SLS uh, is the Orion uh, spacecraft, and that Orion spacecraft houses four crew members for up to 21 days uh, in deep space. And uh, we'll have an uncrewed test in a few months launching on the SLS, and Orion's going to go around the moon for up to 40 days. On Artemis II, we will have the first test of the humans on board uh, Orion. So four people will fly on Artemis II. We'll also uh, circle the moon for about 10 to 12 days. Uh, and then our third mission will be our landing. So the moon is back in play. Obviously it's close to the Earth, so it's a short flight, relatively speaking. And the Mars a little bit further out. Obviously everyone knows what's going on in Mars. A lot of people are interested in Mars. The moon's closer. Yes. But there's also new things going on around discovery. Can you share the big story around why the moon, what's, why is the moon so important, and why is everyone so excited about it? Yeah, you, you, know, um, you know, coming to this conference and talking about sustainability. You know, I mean, it is, exploration is, I think, ingrained in our DNA. But it's more than just exploration, it's about you know, projecting human presence beyond our Earth, and uh, these are the stepping stones. You know, we talk about, uh, Amazon talks about day one, and I think about we are on those very early days where we're building the infrastructure, so Ryan's a transportation infrastructure, and we're going to build infrastructure on the moon to learn how to live uh, on a surface and how to utilize the assets. And then that's very important because you know, it's very expensive to carry fuel, to carry water, uh, and all the necessities that you need to survive as a human being in outer space. If you can generate that on the surface or on the planet you go to, and this is a perfect way to do it because it's very in your backyard, as I told you earlier. Um, so for future missions, when you want to go to Mars, you're nine months out, you really want to make sure you have the technologies and you're able to utilize those technologies robustly and in a sustainable way. Yeah, we were talking before you came on, you came camera. Camping in your backyard is a good practice round before you go out into the, to the wilderness. This is kind of what's going on here, but there's also the discovery angle. I mean, I just see so much science going on there. So if you can get to the moon, get a base camp there, get set up, then things could come out of that. What are some of the things that you guys are talking about that you see as possible exploration upside? Yeah, well, se several things. One is uh, power generation. Uh, recently, we just uh, released some contracts at Fission Power, so long sustainable power capability is very, very important. Um, you know, the other technologies that you, you utilize is uh, regenerative, uh, you know, air, water, things that are, you need for that. But then there's a science aspect of it, which is, you know, we're going to the South Pole where we think there's a lot of water potentially or, or available water that we can extract and utilize that to generate fuel. So liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, is one of the areas that are very interesting. Of course, uh, lunar minerals are very exciting, um, very interesting to bring and, and, and be able to mine potentially in the future, uh, depending on what is there. Well, a lot of cool stuff happening. What's your take on this show here? Obviously, NASA's reputation uh, as innovators um, and deep technologists, you know, big moonshot missions, pun intended here. You got a lot of other explorations. What's this show bring together? Share your perspective, because I think the story here to me is, you got walkout retail like the Amazon technology, you got 
Boston Dynamics, the dog everyone loves, that's walking around. And then you got supply chain, robotics, machine learning, and space. It all points to one thing, innovation around industrial, I think. What, what, what's, your, what's, your, what's your take? Well, you know, I think one of the things is, is you know, normally we're innovating in a, uh, in our aerospace industry. You know, I think there's so much to learn from innovation across all these areas you described and trying to pull some of that into the spacecraft. You know, when, when you're a human being sitting in a spacecraft, it's more than just flying the spacecraft. You know, you have interaction with displays, you have a lot of uh, uh, technologies that you normally would want to interact with on the ground that you could apply in space to help you and make your tasks easier. And I think those are things that are really important as we look across you know, the whole entire innovative infrastructure that I see here in this show, how can we extract some of that and apply it in the space program? I think there is a very uh, significant leveraging that you could do off of that. What are some of the cool things that have gone on Because to me it's like, we're in the cloud business, we love the edge, but I've never had the luxury to peek on the curtain, the curtain, and look at what's going on in the So what are some of the cool things that people who aren't following the day to day well, well, certainly, you know, the Artemis mission, Artemis campaign is one of the, the, the coolest things I can think of. That's why I came into, you know, I think wrapping around that where we are not only just going to a destination, but we're exploring and we're trying to establish a very clear long-term presence. That will allow us to engage what I think is the next step, which is science. You know, and science and the, and the things that can, can come out of that in terms of scientific discoveries. And I think the cool, coolest yeah. thing would be, hey, could we take the things that we are in the labs and the innovation relative to power generation, relative to uh, ener energy um, yes. uh, development of energy technologies, robotics mm -hmm. to utilize to help explore uh, the surface, and of course the science that comes out of just naturally when you go somewhere, you don't know what to expect. <laughs> and I think that's what the exciting thing. And for NASA, we're putting a program, an infrastructure around that. I think that's really exciting. And of course, the other parts of NASA is science, yeah. and so the partnering those two pieces together to accomplish a very important mission for everybody on planet Earth is, is yeah. really important. And also, it's a curiosity. People are being curious about what's going on now in space because the costs are down. Um, and you got universities here, and you got the confluence of robotics and industrial. This is going to provide a, a new ground for education, younger, younger generation coming up. What would you share to teachers and potential students, people who want to learn, what's different about now than the old generation, and what's the same? What, what's the same and what's new? What's, how does someone get their arms around this, their mind around it, where can they jump in? Uh, this is going to open up the aperture for, for, for talent. I mean, with all the technology, it's not one dimensional. Yeah, I think what is still true is core sciences, math, you know, engineering, the hard science, chemistry, biology. I mean, I think those are really also very important. But what we're, we're getting today is the amount of collaboration we're able to do, I guess, organically, and I think the innovation that's driven by a lot of this collaboration, where you have these tools and your ability to engage, and then you're able to, to get, I would say, the best out of people in lots of different areas, and that's what I think one of the things we're learning at NASA is, you know, we have a broad uh, spectrum of um, people that come to work for us, and we're pulling that, and now we're coming to these kinds of things where we're kind of getting even more uh, innovation ideas and partnerships so that we're not just off on our own thinking about the problem. We're branching out and allowing a lot of other people to help us solve the problems that we need. You know, I noticed with Space Force too, I had the same kind of conversations around those with those guys as well. Collaboration and public-private partnerships are huge. You're seeing a lot more kind of cross-pollination of funding, yeah. uh, technology, software, I mean, how do you do break, fix, and space? It's software, right? So you got to have, I mean, it's got to work. So you got security challenges. Yeah. This is a new frontier. It is. The it cybersecurity, is. the usability, the operationalizing for humans, not just, you know, prototypical, you know, scientists and, and, and astronauts who are, you know, in peak shape. We're talking about humans. Yeah. What's the big problem to solve? Is it security? Is it what, what would you say the big challenges yeah, are? Yeah, you know, I think information and access to information and how we interact with information is probably our biggest challenge because we have very limited space in terms of not only mass, but just volume. Yeah. You know, you want to reserve the space for the people and they, they need to, you know, you, you want to uh, maximize your space that you have in spacecraft. 
And so I think having access to information, being able to, to utilize the information and quickly access systems so you can solve problems. Because you don't know when you're in deep space, you're several months out to Mars, what problems you might encounter and what kind of systems and access to information you need to help you solve the problems. You know, both, both, both from a just unplanned kind of contingencies or even planned yeah. contingencies where you want to make sure you have that information to do it. Yeah. So information is going to be very vital as we yeah. go out into deep space. And the infrastructure's changed. How has the infrastructure changed in terms of support services? I mean, see in the United States, just the growth of aer aerospace you mentioned earlier is, is just phenomenal. You've got smaller, faster, cheaper equipment, um, density, it solved the technology. Where's the going to be the, the big game-changing move, movement? Where do you see it go? Is it Artemis 3 it kind of kicks in? Uh, Artemis 1 is obviously the, the first one, unmanned one, but where do you, in your mind do you see key milestones that are going to be super important yeah. to watch? I think, I think, I think you know, we've already you know, pushed the boundaries of what we, we're, you know, in terms of applying our aerospace technologies for Artemis 1 and certainly 2, we've got those in, in work already, and so we've got that, those vehicles already in work and built, yeah. one already at the, at the Kennedy Space Center, ready for launch. Um, but starting with 3, because you have a lot more interaction, you got to take the crew down with a lander, a human landing system. Uh, you got to build rovers, you got to build a, a capability which they could explore. So mm -hmm. starting with 3 and then 4, we're building the Gateway. Uh, Gateway's orbiting platform around the moon, so for all future missions after Artemis 3, we're going to take Orion to the gateway, the crew gets into the orbiting platform, they get on a human landing system and they go down. So all that interaction, all that infrastructure, and all the support equipment you need, not only in the orbit of the moon, but also yeah. down on the ground, yeah. is going to drive a lot of innovation. You're going to have to realize, oh, hey, I needed this. Now I need to figure out how to yeah. get something <laughs> there, you know? Yeah. And, and how much of the robotics and how much AI you need will be very, very interesting because you'll need yeah. these assistants to help you do your daily routine or lessen your daily routine yeah. so you can focus on the science yeah. and you can focus on doing the advancing those technologies that you're going to need. And you got to have the infrastructure. It's like a road. Yeah. You know, you want to go pop down to the moon, you just pop down, it's already built, it's ready for you. Yep. Come back up. So just ease of use from a deployment standpoint. Is and, and the infrastructure. The things that you're going to need, you know? What is a hab going to look like? <laughs> what are you going to need in a habitat? You know, are, are you going to be able to have the power that you're going to have? How many station power stations are you going to need, right? So mm -hmm. all these things are going to be really, uh, things that are going to be driven by what you need to do the mission. And that drives, I think, a lot of innovation. You know, it's very much like the end goal. What are you trying to solve? And then you go, okay, here's what I need to solve. You build things to solve that problem. There's so many things involved on the mission that I can imagine. Safety's huge, number one. Mm -hmm. Got to be have safe. Yep. Space yep. is a dangerous yes. game. Yeah. It's not pleasant out there. Not for the faint of heart, as not, they say. Not for the faint of heart, that's <laughs> correct. What's the big safety concerns, obviously, besides blowing up and oxygen and water and the basic needs? You know, I think, I think, you know, yeah. I think you've, you said it very well. You know, it is not for the faint of heart. Uh, we try to minimize risk. You know, ascent is one of the big, you're sitting under 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust on the launch vehicle. So it is going very fast and you're flying and, you, and, and it is, it's light because we got solid rocket motors too as well. Once they're lit, they're lit. Yeah. Um, so we have an escape system on Orion that allows the crew to be safe. And of course, we build in redundancy. That's the other thing I think that dr will drive innovation. You know, you build redundancy in the system, but you also think about the kind of issues that you would run into potentially from a safety perspective. You know, how are you going to get out of a situation if you get hit by a meteorite, right? You, you, you are going through the Van Allen belt, you have radiation. So you know some of these things that are harsh uh, on mm -hmm. your vehicle and on, on the human uh, side of the shop too. And so when you have to do these things, you have to think about what are you going to protect for and how do you go protect for that? And we have to find innovations for that. Yeah, and it's also going to be a really exciting area for engineering work. And you mentioned the data, data's huge. Simulations, mm -hmm. running scenarios, yep. this is yep. where the AI comes in. And that seems to me where the dots connect for me is when you start thinking about how to, have, how to run those simulations to yeah. identify what's possible. I think that's a great point. You know, <laughs> Because we have all this computing capability, and because we can run simulations, and because we can collect data, we have terabytes of data. But it's very challenging for humans to analyze at that level. So AI is one of the things we're looking at, which is trying to uh, systematically have a process by which data is culled through, so that the engineering mind is only looking at the things and focus on things that are problematic. So we repeat tests every flight, you don't have to look at all the terabytes of data 
of each test, you have a computer AI do that, and you allow yourself to look at just the pieces that don't look right, have anomalies in the data. Then you're going to do that digging, right? That's where the power of yeah. those kinds of technologies can really help us, because yeah. we have that capability to do a lot of computing. And I think that's why this show, to me, is important, because it, it, it shows for the first time, at least from my coverage of the industry, where technology's not the bottleneck anymore, it's human mind. And we want to live in a peaceful world with climate, we want to have the earth around for a while, yep. so climate change was a huge topic yesterday, and how the force for good, what could come out of the moon shots is to, is to help for earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, better, yeah. Better understanding yeah. there. All good. What's your take on the show? If you had to summarize this show, Remars, from the NASA perspective, also you the S in space. What's the what's going on here? What's the big the big story? Yeah, for, for me, I think it's eye-opening in terms of how much innovation is happening across a spectrum of areas. Um, and I look at various things uh, like Boston Scientific Robots, the, the dog just walking around. I mean, to think, you know, people are applying it in different ways, and then those applications in a lot of ways are very similar to what we need for exploration going forward, and how do you apply some of these uh, technologies to the space program, and how do we leverage that? How do we leverage that innovation, and how we take the innovations already happening organically for other reasons, and how would those help us solve those problems that we're going to encounter uh, going forward as we try to live on another planet? Well, congratulations on a great assignment. You got a great job. <laughs> I did. Um, super fun. I love being an observer, and I love space. Love how uh, the innovations there, and plus, space is, space is cool. I mean, how many millions of live views do you see? Everyone's stopping work to watch SpaceX land and NASA do their work. It's just, it's bringing back the tech vibe. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just things are going, you got a good tailwind. Yeah, Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Howard, Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Yeah. Okay, this is theCUBE coverage. I'm John Furrier here with theCUBE here. Live in Las Vegas, back at reInvent, reinforce, remars, the re-series. Coverage here at remars. We'll be back with more coverage after this short break.